Who's the worst person to give you health advice when it comes to diet? Is it fitness influencers? Hey, we're gonna see how many people we can trick into eating testicles. Is it diet companies and supplement companies? No, none of those. The worst person is the government. They get almost everything wrong for the last, I don't know, four decades. Remember, they told us fat was bad. You know the chief killer of Americans is cardiovascular disease. Keys preached about the risks of fatty foods. And they were wrong. Remember they said, don't eat egg yolks, they're unhealthy for you. You cannot say eggs are safe to eat, can't say they're safe, can't even mention safety. Turns out, they're very healthy for you. Remember when they said dietary cholesterol, avoid it at all costs. Turned out they were completely wrong. So here's my favorite one, margarine. Oh, it's so much better for you <laughs> than butter. Butter is fattening. Wait, this butter is delicious. Oh, that's not butter. I don't believe you, Gloria. You know no. that processed trans fat, weird looking thing? Yeah, no, it's actually not only is it worse for you, it's terrible for your health. Oh yeah, grains. Grains should make up most of your diet. No, probably not. How about this, red meat is unhealthy. The researchers found that a diet that includes red meat raises the risk of developing cardiovascular disease and cancer, as well as health problems like diabetes and high blood pressure. Nope, you're wrong again. Sodium. Sodium needs to be low because low sodium is good for you. Uh, looks like you're wrong again. Oh, here's my favorite one. Skim milk, fat-free milk. That's better than full-fat milk. Well, it turns out skim milk actually can produce bone loss and other issues. It turns out the government is wrong almost all the time. In fact, if you listen to their advice when it comes to diet, you're fat, unhealthy, and sick. And actually, maybe that's what they want all along. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Wow. Oh, maybe yeah. they'll get it right this time, though, Sal. Yeah. I mean, I'm optimistic. Yeah, I told you guys it was coming up. I mean, up. so, okay, do you, you don't obviously subscribe to the conspiracy theory that they actually want us sick and fat and healthy, unhealthy, or do you? I do think you this is the conspiracy theory that I subscribe to is that government policy is heavily influenced by lobby. Okay. And those lobbies are run by big, you know, food yeah, corporations. Yeah, it's money. It's money. And it's all baloney. It's money. Yeah, it's all uh, totally Margarine, baloney. let's make margarine yeah. companies rich and uh, our hands are tied. In it. If it's uh, you know non-fat stuff, it's that direct. I feel like it, it's money always. I don't feel like it's this yeah. this evil plan of like let's make humans well, sick and unhealthy. I think it's like let's figure out a way to make to the corner of the market, make yeah, the information sound positive in the direction of this because it's going to line our pockets. Well, so and here's it's like, and then it just backfires. Here's sometimes. where I start to think that maybe it gets a little more nefarious, just because the information that's wrong has stuck around. Yeah. Like we've, we found out a lot of this stuff is wrong in order to get them to change directions. It's like, uh, trying to get a, you know, cruise ship to stop and turn around. It takes miles and forever and it takes years and decades. Now you, you brought up money, Adam. Look, markets are motivated by money. Half. I mean, our industry, fitness industry is motivated, motivated by money and people will lie in order to make a dollar. But here's the beauty of markets. You find out pretty quick when stuff doesn't work. You just do. Eventually, if a, if a supplement company, they'll make some money at some point. People don't say that's crap. A diet comes out. The ones that tend to stick around have some value. The ones that fall away is because people figured out they don't work. Government dietary advice sticks around for decades. That food pyramid, that crappy one, what was that around for like 20 years, 25 right. years? Easily. I oh, mean, it's I, insane. I think that, okay, there, okay, let's talk about that. So I think that has more to do with the the person who's saying it like comes from a place of authority government like school yeah. like things that were taught in school to a student say 30 40 years that we've found out now is not true is like that that it's ingrained because your professor told you that and a lot of people aren't going and re-educating themselves so if government told you this is the truth you believe it to be true you don't continue to educate or question or learn more. Oh, I don't mean the consumer. I mean the government actual official advice itself. It doesn't change. It's like the same crappy information that we've had for the last 25, 30 years. Oftentimes they only reverse when it becomes so obvious, it's ridiculous. Or, or if we're in such a, if we, I mean that again, I go back to the consumer that like, we're not, people aren't like uh, up in arms over it. 
If they were up in arms over it, making a huge deal about it, then maybe it would. But it, so long as they don't have to, they're not going to. Yeah, I guess know? not. I mean, I, I mean, it just takes longer to change because it's voted rather than yeah. the market. And, and if no, and we're not if we're not you know picketing and yeah. we're not making a big yeah. deal about it, then it's like ah, whatever. We'll just sweep that under the rug. I mean, it's pretty similar to the DMV in terms of like updating anything. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's pretty much what we're looking at in terms of nutrition and fitness advice. It's very archaic and it's it's definitely something needs to be uh revisited and looked at and updated like for your uh today's standards should be completely different than they are it's, well, cr it's crazy because it's not even that they get stuff wrong because they do it's that a lot of the stuff they get wrong turns out to be the opposite of right. correct it's been detrimental like like the egg the yolk problem. one do you know how many people's health got worse because yeah. they avoided egg yolks and they probably didn't get the amount of choline and nutrients that they that they needed that they could have gotten from eggs? Do you know that there's studies showing that skim milk yeah. can cause deficiencies because you don't absorb the vitamin D that's in the milk because there's no fat? So people are actually getting, you know, bone loss uh has been connected to skim milk versus full fat milk. Like this, those are just two examples. Sodium. Yeah. Like the average healthy person, if they cut their sodium too low, they have detrimental effects. In fact, a new one just came out. This is my favorite one. So this whole, we had all this hysteria about plastic straws. Plastic oh, God, straws. I saw this. <laughs> <laughs> I died when I saw this. This is terrible. <laughs> so, by the way. It, it, this is classic. It's example, comical though. is what yeah, it is. 99.99% of the plastic straws that end up in the ocean are from countries that are not the U.S. And yet we're the ones passing these policies. And, and then all these companies jump on board. And, and there's state governments, local governments that require paper straws. Well, it, it just comes out. Studies come out. The type of plastic that they line inside those paper straws are harmful. They're full of xenoestrogens. You're literally, you're literally digesting or ingesting chemicals that are affecting you hormonally through these crappy pla these paper straws that aren't even doing anything because in America, our plastic straws end up in the garbage, not in the ocean. Okay, so let's let's speculate uh, like how something like that happens. Okay, so I have like a theory on like how how that goes down. Right, there's like some brothers, uncles, sisters, family is starting this company up, <laughs> right? That is moving to paper straws who is connected enough to somebody who could go in and actually pass law. They go write some big thing out and then they look at it and they go, oh, that sense. like a fine. Such okay. a realistic example. That's what I like. I, I have no idea. It probably didn't happen that way, but I, Something I, like that, I okay. really believe like that's how a lot of this stuff goes down. And it's like as simple as somebody looks it over and goes, oh, how, how bad could this be? Going from plastic to paper? Sounds like a good enough idea. Oh, the whole world is scared now about plastic in the ocean right now. Oh, that's actually a great idea. Oh, in fact, can you get me some stock in that? You know, and they're all telling each other, right? So yeah. before it passes. Oh, wait a minute. A paper just by itself will totally disintegrate <laughs> as you're drinking through it. So we have to put some plastic in there to keep it <laughs> some kind of structure to it. And it's just like, yeah, it just becomes a yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, okay, so I didn't even read. I, I saw the I saw the headlines and mm -hmm. I actually didn't even read the full article on like, so what is it about the paper straws that are now, that well, they're saying is more harmful than the plastic? Yeah, the the, chemicals. There's, yes, the, the plastic, they, they line them with, uh, so if you look at a paper straw, you can tell it's kind of shiny. They they coat it in something to prevent it from completely disintegrating while you use it, even though they, after it's a while, like higher they BPA or whatever. Yeah, but, and they still do disintegrate as you continue. So what's they happening, do, yeah. the plastic. That's so now it disintegrates against in your like, system. At least the plastic, it didn't disintegrate, right? Yeah, dude. And these are, these like are five minutes. And there's done. xenoestrogens, which, which have been connected to things like cancers, testosterone oh, going God. down, it's you know, different uh, type of hormonal issues in women, fertility issues. And you're sitting there drinking your whatever in these straws. You're like, this is better for the environment. No, it's not. It's not because people are sicker. Sicker people don't innovate. Sicker, sicker people can't produce. Um, and that's the, the 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 solution for the environment are smart, healthy people who can innovate. Not sick, unhealthy okay, people. Okay, so the, the next question. And it's question. also not even helping the environment because our plastic straws don't end up in the ocean. It, that's a fact. They're, this is like well-documented. The plastic straws that end up in the ocean are coming from countries yeah. that dump shit in the ocean. That we literally know. dump the trash dump in, in the ocean. ocean. Yes. Like then so, no accountability either. Yeah. Okay, so the, so the next question I have is, when do we start to see the reversal of this? Uh, well, now that this study came out, hopefully... Hopefully they'll reverse it because there's a lot of. I mean, Maybe they'll just go where we're, where we're at. There's the a coastal lot. states. Yeah, there's a lot of that over here. I don't think it's going away. You know, I mean, you're going to know the. Product. You'll know the first because almost all the restaurants over by you well, are like that. Yeah. Did you guys notice? So it'll be interesting to see. Did if you guys they notice it. here that the the remember there was a second where they banned plastic bags at the grocery store, mm -hmm. and now now you can use them again. Yeah. 
So that didn't last because when you do the math, when you actually have to calculate out the impact on the environment, you have to calculate out the production. How the, many trees you're probably cutting? Hey, no, well, just too. the production, um, the transport and all that stuff. And plastic bags transport very well. They last a long time. Doesn't cost as much energy to produce them. So when you do the whole package, when you look at the whole number, you're actually, it's, it's, it's a wash. And so I think that that data came out and, and they, they, the loss kind of let, they let them fall by the wayside. Yeah. Um, yeah. So oh, that's I know and that's the thing. You have to look at the whole picture when you make these, these, uh, policies or these knee jerk well, reactions, but this one pisses me off on a global scale. I'm out immediately when you start to look at like India and China and like the amount of gross pollution, <laughs> like, we're not even close. Like we, unless there's any accountability there, it's like a stupid conversation. You, you know, what really pisses people off and they can look it up. This is true. Do you know how much of your stuff that you recycle gets recycled? Oh yeah, it's barely I, any. I remember when I heard they this. don't recycle it. Yeah, yeah, is this too much? They used to take recycling and sell it to other countries like China, and then China would do something with it. They stopped buying our recycling, so we're literally taking our recycling. You can look this up, and they throw it in the garbage. <laughs> I think it's only aluminum and maybe glass. Meanwhile, my trash man won't pick up my trash if I have one bit of food in my freaking recycle bin. <laughs> Did you look through it? <laughs> I've had I've been in trouble before. Really? <laughs> really? Uh, for not bagging it the one yeah, time they got yeah. mad at me. Yeah, but, dude. Like, what I'm the like, fuck, ah, bro? <laughs> dude, I, I complained once because the guy, I don't know who what he was doing. He kept throwing my, my, my can on the ground all like upside down and shit. I got so bad. So I called him up. I'm like, your dude needs to come back and Pick this back. It's for the we just got a bring bring him back. back. Yeah. We just got a letter for our neighborhood that says like the, that now there's like a, a specific distance your cans need to be from the each other so that I guess to make it easier and for uh, like the the gravity or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, or they won't pick them up now. It's like, oh my god, oh, this is too much. Look at this. This is what the study shows. You're making demands. I'll read you what the study says. This is the title of the of the articles. The study reveals paper straws contain dangerous. Ready for this? Forever chemicals. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So they stay. These, these are for, these are more harmful forever chemicals than plastic straws. Man, isn't that nice? So they tested thirty nine straw brands for synthetic chemicals known as uh, PFAS. All right, today's giveaway is Maps Symmetry. If you want to win that, you got to do this: leave a comment below this video in the first twenty four hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a massive sale this month. This one's actually one of the biggest ones I've seen in a while. Maps Symmetry, half off. And the RGB bundle is half off. So it's already discounted to take an additional 50% off. So this is huge. If you're interested in either one, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Back to the whole government thing. Like, so... Again, was it you that that brought up the uh, cities that are now like opting in for this meatless uh, smart city kind of design? Oh, it, it was it was a good number of cities, like yeah. major cities in the U.S. that were like all on board. Now that's this. not Bro, that's Austin, the, Chicago. There was big but, ones, but yeah. that's the city. Uh, buildings themselves, not like the whole city. Like they're not. Yeah, but that was a big initiative, which is yeah. back to that point of like, why meat is healthy for you? It's it's an essential part of getting good protein and fats. That like, and you're going to eliminate a major food group like that. How are you going to get that? Do you know what would happen today if right now all Americans just stopped eating meat? You'd have massive nutrient deficiencies of course. Big across the board. Of course. It's yeah. one of the only it's, things that people it's eat that's even close to eggs, milk, and meat is one of the only whole foods that the average person eats. And if you cut, well, I mean, if you cut them all out, you're going to have massive nutrient deficiency. That's why sometimes I'm like, do they really I want mean, it's this? I mean, it's the healthiest part of fast food too. Think about it. I'm <laughs> yeah, serious. I know. Totally. Everything else is a bunch of processed fake shit. It's not even real that people are eating. It's like the, the meat is like the closest thing to real. And even that's processed and not the greatest, but I mean, it's still closer than like everything else they got there and that's how many americans live off of that i mean what's the percentage of people that live off of fast food it's got to be I super know, high I know. it's terrible advice so you take out that it's like yeah I don't know, that's so go to alternative sources yeah uh, like <laughs> yeah podcasts or, I, now, yeah, now here's the thing i just don't eat i don't use straws i, I just, i'm cool without ever using a straw again i don't think you're supposed to as a man that, yeah, that's I, what I, I was going to say I that, but I don't want to be too. Yeah, I get offended when I'm at a, like a bar or restaurant. They give me a straw in there. You get mad at them. Yeah. yeah what the hell is this? Okay. So when you actually have to <laughs> use a straw, <laughs> like how do you do it? <laughs> it's, just, huh? it's not for my chick. It's for me. How do you do it? Like, when yeah, I have a straw? Yeah. If you, if you have a straw, there's like a technique dude. to just give it back. No, like if you're drinking out of a straw, like you oh, know, like how you have to hold it manly. What you do you just do? Got to make sure it's like out of the side and it's like oh, you, you know, got to do it sideways a little yeah, bit. Sideways. Like you're not like <laughs> you're, like move. you're reluctant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
like, not like straight on. Hey, yeah. there's a way, by the way, that a man also holds his wife's purse when she goes to the bathroom. Like all, yeah, like I, this, hold, I don't hold it on the handles. I hold it <laughs> no. on the actual yeah, you, bag of yeah, it. yeah. Oh, you or the strap, you or you grab the stain. Or you actually, grab I did. Hear, I saw a guy carrying it by the strap the other yeah, day. I was like, yeah, what are you like, doing, nah, bro? Yeah, yeah. Nah, bro. Or like or that. you grab the strap like this, like not like the top. Crush like, it. No, yeah, no, you wrap the you wrap the strap around the so you're you're gripping it like that. That's the most. That's the most manual, accepted way. way to hold a purse. manly way you can yeah, hold okay. a purse. Don't ever hold your wife's purse <laughs> yeah, on your shoulder. Over either. your shoulder. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Put out an ebook for this. I'll punch you. Oh, what is that percentage you gave me right there? <clears throat> yeah, one third of Americans eat fast food every single day. Oh, wow. 36 points. Dude, did I, tell you, I didn't tell you guys what wow. I did the other day. What did you do? Would you eat I did something I haven't done in years and oh, years wow, and wow. years. I ate Jack in the Box. Oh, my God. I've had Jack in the Box. I don't before. know. Did you I eat know. the tacos? No. Oh. No. Every once in a while, I crave those. Even I tell when the I eat, she always hey, laughs at me. She's like, "What?" Hey, even when I eat fast food, which I never do, but even if I do, I still try to avoid food intolerances. You know what I mean? So I'm like, "I'll get this, no cheese." <laughs> oh my god! I know. <laughs> yeah, what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what it is? Is because you know I got sick, my appetite got destroyed, uh, yeah. and I just wasn't eating enough because it's my appetite was so low, and it finally started ramping up, and I'm just like, I need cal. I don't remember where I was, and I, I couldn't get food, and I'm looking at the jack in the box. <laughs> What the hell? They got I the regret Colossus it. Colossus burger, right? Oh, it's like the it three right patty you. all bacon. It went right through me. Yeah. I can't remember. We were somewhere in a pinch, and I drove through and had something at a fast food place. It was This was like a year or two ago. But, I mean, that's just how, like, infrequent. You could taste the engineering, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's 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 actually, I was part of me, it was like a little excited. I'm like, oh, I haven't done this forever. Like, this will be good. You know, it wasn't at all, actually. It was... It was like Carl's Jr., which was like one of my favorite oh, yeah. ones. I used to like, I used yeah. to like them. That was the yeah, only we one were, I really We were liked. somewhere driving, and I can't remember where we were going, but it was real late at night. And I hadn't eaten all day, and I, I and I was like, I got to eat something, right? And the only thing that was open, and I was like, that was my option. Not a Taco Bell? Oh, no Ooh, way I would dude. do that. Ta uh, I, I made the mistake of doing that like 10 years ago. That's liquid drain. It, yeah, exactly. it just destroyed. In and out. Another one I used to have as a kid, but I couldn't. It just destroyed <laughs> me, and I'm like, never again. They so. used to give Taco Bell used to be at my high school. We used to have so the, do we. their bean burritos. So do we. Yeah. What a deal they signed with the yeah, public schools. Right? Okay, so yeah. that'd be really interesting. That's funny you brought that up. I always thought that was fascinating about my high school. That we had, so we had like a, um, a, a break. So we had, uh, I don't, it was like called break. I think it was what it was before lunch. Right? You had yeah, like it's a, a break. Yeah. Like or a recess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's high school, so you don't call it recess, right? right? So it's like a break yeah. between, you know, before Kickball. the lunch break. And then we had these, these food carts that always came out into the courtyard. And uh, it was just a bunch of random stuff, chips and- Yeah, made and, in the cafeteria. Yeah, yeah. But you, the one thing we could get That's was Taco Bell burritos. The bean burritos. Yeah. That's exactly what we had. They I, must have signed some They deal. had to have. Yeah. I, and I thought that was so unique to us. I never heard anybody else do that. I didn't know they did that. <laughs> you they must school special. I did. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm out in the middle of nowhere to too. I was like, how did, that's yeah. why I thought it was so weird. I'm like, how did we get this out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> yeah. They must have signed. I bet you Taco Bell signed something with the schools to get that. Probably oh, a I'm lucrative sure. deal. Yeah. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Public school probably spent more on the, than if they went to Taco Bell and bought it themselves. Oh yeah. You know, type of deal. Uh, no, I'm sure that's that's, that's how crazy. it happened. Oh, Dude, I had funny. I had such a cool moment. I've had a couple of these moments since we started the podcast it's such a weird feeling uh to have uh, so i'll tell you guys what happened right so we get contacted by danica patrick who wants me to be on her podcast mm -hmm. now danica patrick was like a, i mean she's obviously still famous i think she's still um she's still one of the like what are they called when there's like a sporting event and there's a person commentating commentator right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she commentates on i believe formula one if i'm not mistaken okay. Um, but back in the day, she was like, she was on the cover of like magazines. Oh, yeah. I caught one of her races at De La uh, Viega. Or Did you? La Viega. In person? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was Sears, Sears Point. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 So oh, no she, she was like a big deal, right? When we were like yeah, in yeah, 20s and she was on magazines, she was on TV, she was on radio. She was well, she was the first female driver to make it that far, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And she's a badass, right? Yeah, so, she was great. And I remember, it's like, it's like a big name, you know, growing up, seeing her or whatever. So then I, I get on the, and so I'm like, oh, this is crazy, Danica Patrick. Like, that's so wild, right? <laughs> so I get on, and she's a fan of ours. Yeah. And I got that weird feeling I had when we met Arthur Brooks. Same thing, where I'm yeah, like, you were you're fan. my fan? Like, I'm a huge fan <laughs> of yours. <laughs> Totally. So weird. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird to hear you know something like that. But yeah. she's she's a big fan. She got a great show. Um, she does a good job. Somebody was asking me that. So at the NCI thing, I, I had my NCI on Wednesday or whatever when I talked to the group, and that was one of the questions I got asked. Somebody was like, "Who's the most who's the most like famous person that listens to Mind Pump?" Oh. I'm like, you know, I don't know. I actually brought up. 
I said, I don't know who that is. I said, but just the last month, I said, I found out about Danica Patrick because she interviewed Sal. And I said, and then Russell Dickerson, country singer, who I found out about. I mm. said, so, I mean, I don't think... Uh, I don't think famous people put that stuff out there that often. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. That's the one. Of, I remember how we used to always like, man, I always, I was going to take, if we get one famous person to <laughs> talk about mind pump. Then we're what gonna, do they call that? Like the ghost follow us or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, we talk. got a bunch of ghost follower yeah. uh, people. I mean, I just think you just don't want uh, the attention. I mean, you don't, they don't want, she's, at that, she's that. at that level where she's not trying to draw any more attention to herself. Yeah. So and also would, I think when you're yeah. a super high level, every little mention is worth a lot of money. So it's like, uh, why am I going to mention anything unless it really makes an impact on them i guess would be the thing i mean that's right. what i think we always hoped right was that i mean that's how like uh russell dickerson did it right like he started following our programs and that was i know like, kanye listens you should post about it <laughs> <laughs> kanye go ahead and tag us <laughs> <laughs> i don't even think kanye lifts weights does he lift weights i don't know, if he I don't lifts know. Weights. he's following maps on a ball like i was texting <laughs> you know he's, he's jackrat method man dude oh like, is he he's jack right is he now really? like, yeah he's deadlift like 500 pounds like wow. I was really like, wow he's getting after it yeah i wow. remember when 50 cent like show. made that term remember when 50 yeah. cent was all chubby and fat and then he got on his kick and then he got like shirt and then every music video after that was like no shirt on i don't think yeah. he put a shirt on for like three years i love seeing musicians <laughs> like starting to figure out oh wow i can i can also lift <laughs> weights and be hey most i i share uh i used to all the time i actually still to this day i try to find it the last time i brought this up um LL Cool J had a book, and I don't know if it was his trainer who oh, wrote it with him or someone else wrote it for him. I remember this. But yeah, he was a, he was a workout book, and he had a great section that was like listed like foods to never eat, foods to sometimes eat. And I used to print it off for clients and have them put them. I remember this. It was such a great resource. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, remember I remember finding it and being like, you know what? I don't have a good list like it's this. It's very simple, great, very yeah. general yeah. advice. Yeah, yeah it's totally not. Advice. There's not like it's not like this crazy. It's just that it's just it's so basic, so easy. And clients got the, I would, and then I would tell them, I'd say, Hey, listen, uh, this week, don't allow yourself to have more than two foods off that list. Don't, and then, and it was like so easy for them. They're like, okay, I could just, that's why it worked. Yeah. yeah that's why it worked. It was yeah. who are the most valuable. jacked celebrity. Oh, there he is. That's the book right there. What's it called? Platinum 360. Is that it? I thought it was, but then I, I, I think, think I actually looked, I think I looked it up and it didn't have the food thing in there. Yeah, I, I couldn't know. find it. So LL's got to be up about. there, 50 Cent's up there. What, Danzig, like most Jack Mark Wahlberg. Danzig, be, yeah. yeah, Wahlberg is up. Just like Jack celebrity. Although right? ever since Wahlberg started doing F45, he's not as jacked as uh, he used to be. Uh, <laughs> doesn't work. Uh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> he's super. He's, he's, he's apparently a very disciplined father, too. Very disciplined. Wahlberg? Kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, business person. He definitely seems on top of things. He does, sure. right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know the yeah. guy. Who knows? Yeah, I don't seems trust like anything like this. Know. You know what I'm saying? Like you, the celebrities. Yeah, I just feel like you have to. Okay, so let's play this game for a little bit. Like you're you're Mark Wahlberg rich. Like what are you doing? Still doing all that work? I mean, and then you claim that you. And I know everyone's claim is this, right? The default is I love it. It's what yeah, I'm passionate yeah. about. Well, okay, I, I love my kids and my wife too, right? Yeah. And at what? And if I'm having, you better be careful, bro, because I don't know if you can ever not work. I will <laughs> always work. Okay, but if you haven't figured out how we shape this business up, we yeah. continue to as we scale, scale out. Yeah, like exactly. I mean, scale out. There's and I and I and I 100 recognize that there's more money on the table, but that I'm not driven only by that. Yeah. Yes, I am driven by that, and I and I openly admit that I like material things and I like money and success and stuff like that, but not at the extent yeah. of sacrificing other things. Yeah. Like, I don't want to look back at, you know, and be 65 and be like just stupid rich and then be like, man, I didn't travel. I didn't do that one thing with my wife. I didn't, my my son, you know, knows his dad is the, the workaholic and the grind. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah. want that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And 100%. like, and I, and I, and by the way, I totally, man, fucking some people don't have a choice. You know what I'm saying? But if I have a choice, Mark Wahlberg has a choice. I think I have a choice, right? Like, uh, at what point do you like stop making so many movies or you stop starting so many businesses? Yeah. Like, cause there's things you can still do to, to build and make money that don't require, I, I really think a lot of those people have an addiction. Of course. And they justify it through, I love it. Do you know how hard you know, it is? Just like yeah. everybody else with an addiction justifies their addiction. Always. Do you know how hard it is for some people to feel a sense of purpose when they're not driving and striving hard with work, especially for a lot of men? It's really oh, hard. Yeah. Just like without that, still is like impossible for a lot of people. We were talking about that I show. I struggle with that sometimes. We were talking about that show with Tyson Fury. Yeah, where he's just like he's, he's lost. He's been this fighter, this boxer. He always has this goal, and I was trying to retire. I don't think he lasted very long. Bro, right? his yeah. poor wife. I, I was Katrina and I were talking about that. Like we watched it together, and I was just like, man, it's 
has has got a solid ass wife, dude. They got six kids. Yeah, she's just been holding it down. They're stupid rich, have everything. He's the greatest of all time. You know what I'm saying? And like, she's finally like, oh, he's gonna hang it up. You know what I'm saying? And then he's like, five months he lasts, and then he's got to go back. I saw my dad go through it because my dad, since he was nine, has been working hard, like hard all the time, all the time. And I saw him when he retired. He went through like a year and a half, two years of depression. So to both both yeah. of my best friends' dads, who are like a second dad to me, same thing. Because they didn't know what to do, right? Yeah, because yeah. they were such grinder. Like they like they had, and they were like labor guys. Like they had to work six, seven days a week of yeah. like digging ditches and like crazy shit. And they worked their whole lives to provide for their family, and then they finally get to retirement. They know what the fuck to do? Bro, my dad. They know what to do with themselves? My dad redid the backyard. You can only play, you can only play golf so many times. Oh, he redid the backyard. <laughs> you know? He remodeled this section of the house so that my mom would be like talking to my mom. My mom's like, "Your dad." Is cleaning the house better than I could ever. He goes, she goes, he's so like he'd get on the floor and like scrape because he needed something to like drive yeah, him, you know? Busy, yeah. But then finally what he did is he and this this helped out, is he he got himself he's always ridden motorcycles when he was a kid, kind of stopped for about a while. But then he bought himself a, a motorcycle, got himself a Ducati. Actually, one of his friends uh hooked him up with a Ducati. He's got this really close friend. And then he became he became a part of this group of of like guys that ride motorcycles. Mm -hmm. Now he does these like long rides. And so he's found his like rhythm. Yeah, yeah. But there was like a couple of years there where he was just, he was going crazy. He's like, what do yeah. I do? I used to wake up every morning, go to work, work real hard. Now I wake up and, and like, what am I going to do? Watch TV? Well, yeah. I mean, I feel, I feel like that's the ultimate sort of trajectories. If you can, if you can grind, you can work hard and you can scale yourself out to where you, you just find those few things that you really enjoy, but it's still like, you got to work at it. Yeah. You got to get better at, or it's like a, a hobby. That's an obsession that you could be dive all the way into. Like that's sort of the move, but like just to retire and cut everything off. Like I just, this that's is, depressing. This is why like old guys will have like train sets. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're oh, in totally. their basement and oh, shit. Totally. They got their little conductor hat yeah. and they're like Yeah, what's he doing? Why is yeah. he I mean, I, I, that's why I really I really enjoyed that book, Die with Zero. I thought that was a really good read for that exact reason because part of that is this like this conversation of like becoming mindful of that yeah. as you're as you're building and you're and you're stacking and you're you're planning for retirement. It's not like it sound it's obviously it's got a crazy title. It sounds like you should literally like be broke and die with nothing. It's like that's not the point of it. It's like it's talks all about investments and setting your the next like generation up but also like learning how to like utilize money and time and so that when you have all those things it's like i don't want to uh and you're right i will 100 percent work i'll do something because i i do enjoy to work i enjoy building things i enjoy that that aspect but not at the expense of yeah. time with my wife and kids but then i don't also want to spend that much time with my wife and kids where all i do is 24 well, 7 is that, that i want to break from them too which well, is Arthur, <laughs> Arthur wrote that book yeah. um about it and uh he said that the key according to the data was to go from to switch from doing to teaching mm. he said when people yeah, retire and then they stop the doing and then they switch to teaching others to do what they did he mm -hmm. says that their quality of life goes up i could see myself doing that like i could see myself volunteering and helping with rehab or exercise or schools or doing talks about health. Mm -hmm. Like I could see myself doing that and feeling totally fulfilled, uh, you know, doing that. Yeah. yeah a than, taste of that working with the school. And it's like, Oh, it's like, okay, I could do this when I retire, but right now it doesn't make any sense. You know, totally just the amount of hey, investment. Speaking of work and making lots of money and stuff like that, you know, it's how I've like, I'm super fascinated or I became fascinated over the weekend over Legos. Oh, so uh, Dude, uh, for, I've always loved Legos. Man. I know your kids have been on like, car. I mean, your kids Lego passed guy. down their Lego set to to Max, and we just haven't really opened it because he's not into it. He's not yeah. at that age yet where he's he can do that yeah. stuff. It's like the Legos are a little more advanced for him. And for his birthday, he got a couple different Lego sets, and in fact, they were the things that we didn't know. We opened them and then we put them away. I don't know if you guys ever do this or not, but you get so many damn toys, we like yeah. hide them away, and we're like, we'll yeah, pull you bring them out every once. Yeah, we'll pull yep. them out every once in a while. So, you know, we decided this weekend we'd pull out something back from his birthday. Uh, that we it was a Lego set, and because he's into Mario, someone had bought him a, a, a Mario Lego set, and so um, of course I have to build it with him because it's actually for like I don't know eight or nine year olds, you know. So it's definitely too advanced for him. But together we did it and had a blast. And I was just like, I haven't touched Lego since I was a kid, so I hadn't realized how much they have progressed and like oh, what yeah. they have done. Yeah, and I just went down the rabbit hole of like looking at the company and owners and all the other shit, right? So. First of all, they they had, they partnered with with uh, you know Nintendo and and Mario and stuff like that mm -hmm. to have the, the mm -hmm. rights to do the Mario thing and the the Mario stuff is interactive, mm -hmm. so 
you first had to build the Mario character and like the like the castle and all stuff like that. And then he has a battery in him and he has like a basically like a Bluetooth thing that connects to all the other pieces. And so you he makes sound effects and then and then it's connected to your phone. So it's like acquiring coins and points. Oh wow, and, as you oh, move the physical mm -hmm. oh, wow, yes. that's and smart. all the instructions. Oh, by the way, too, to build. Which was like part of the reason why I wasn't looking forward to opening it. I was like, oh, I don't want to, bro. What if I can't do it? You know, what if I? <laughs> it's like my son's gonna be like, it's not even the technical. Yeah, dude, I'm Legos. not the engineer. I know, I know, I know where my wheelhouse you is. Have embarrass yourself. Yeah, it's not, it's like, go get the baseball. Go get the oh, basketball, son. This one's broken. Yeah, yeah. But it has like uh, all step by step on your phone yeah. or your iPad, yeah. and it's like super easy and follow along. And I was just like, man, super fascinated with what they've done and then again that's why i was like man let me i this is how I, this is how my brain works like when i get into something like that did you like, buy stock i went to go buy stuff did right? you? <laughs> so I, i'm like <laughs> my Katrina, could you look up the ticker for this and she couldn't find it so i get in there and i'm like oh shit this it's is privately private privately owned oh yeah. i don't know it's not yeah. bro it's not public. It's a fa the family yeah. and they've kept it like they, with all these partnerships you'd think oh man like disney must have bought you know into them or or you know nintendo or, or whatever like not it's all just like privately owned in-house are they Based the, the in Europe, the, the, they're Denmark. Denmark, yeah, that's Denmark. where the grant. The grandson is the CEO. Okay, so the grandson of the founder. So 1930 right, something right, is when right, the company right. was founded. He's one of the richest men in the world. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Filthy rich, and they're all they're privately wow. owned. I love Legos. I think it's such a constructive toy for kids. It oh, gets yeah. them off electronics. It's you're building something. It's very creative. Um, they're great. So along those lines. I was like looking up. Uh, I think that I was on YouTube looking up things along, and then this pops in my feed. I see, and I heard my buddies mention it, but I hadn't really looked into it. Universal Studios just built a Super Mario like land, and I looked it up and watched like the full tour you, of it. You got to take your kid, bro. It he's is, gonna lose his mind. It is sick. Yeah. It's like you take like two days to go through it so Dude. big. So we're gonna go to Universal you, at some point soon. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Maybe we should, oh, okay. Oh, I'm you like, and what they did, which I really like, I was telling Justin this, is they made it so interactive that it's it's physical. So it's not just going sitting on rides or just going and looking at stuff. Like you go and you get this wristband. And this and this wristband, you you make you catch coins. You play you play physical games. Yeah. You, you hit have the to, question mark box, and you get coins, and and you get like so it fire promotes flowers, activity all that stuff. Yeah, and physical. It's and cool. so it's real. And then it has AR, so you get in the ride and you put on the thing, and it's like augmented reality so we, stuff. So like, we went uh, a few years ago, and they had a Harry Potter area, mm -hmm. and it was like that. You had this wand, and you would go up to like areas and try and find secrets. And if you did a special way of moving it, like a wall would open and things would come yes, out. Yes, it's That's like that. Really, really smart. Yeah, it's it really smart. smart. Really smart. And yeah. I did. I didn't know that it was like this. And I thought, man, this is really cool. And I love. Where I mean, this is this is where I always have like hope for humanity when we talk about all the things that are like, oh my god, and technology and kids are being addicted to this. It's like you know what? Like you, then you see companies and businesses that see that and then like try and like, okay, how do we still utilize how all these? Put a physical component. To yeah, this? like yeah. how do we how do we recognize the the faults of these of these kids staring at screens and doing nothing all day long, but then still make it yeah. like futuristic and interactive and cool? It's like. So I really feel like they did that with this. It's like, oh, this is really cool. This is something I would take my son to and get a kick out of, like, using the phone and yeah. the, all the tech and stuff That's like awesome. that. But then knowing that it's all interactive like that. He's going to lose his oh, he'll mind because yeah, he he's so into Mario. Oh, yeah. No, he'll go he'll I would go love crazy. to see. Yeah, I'd love to see more companies, you know, pay attention. To that. I mean, obviously, you saw that a bit with, like, Pokemon Go, and it became, like, this sort yeah. of phenomenon. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was kind of like our hope a long time ago when we were trying to work on stuff with like, well, what, you know, what, what sort of incentives can you put out there for that community of people that just like to stare at a screen all day. Yeah. And it's like, it's so immersive and engaging to, to create something physical like that, where they could actually show up and have a similar experience, but it's physical. I think that'd be rad. Yeah. That one app you showed us is like that, right? The one in San Francisco where you find the, where people pooped on the, on the street. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't want to go trace through. those steps, dude. Uh, dude, I got hey, a. Yeah. I, I got. I always wear from Viore the Sunday joggers or the slacks. I don't know which ones these are. I, I which socks. Oh, are those the new ones? Yes, those are the core joggers. Core. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't think I'd like them, but yeah. I like them a lot. I like them too. I actually. So, well, you're wearing them. Are you? Oh, you're in actually in a normal. It's a nice. No, shirt. I got everything. I got all. So I, I, Jerry was asking me because she brought them last week to me, and she goes, "Hey, what do you think of the new core joggers that I gave you?" I go, oh, "I really." She's like, "How come you're not wearing them?" I'm like, "Oh." I, I like to dress them up. I feel like they're a little bit dressier than the uh, the Sunday joggers. They are. So they're and light, they're super comfortable. But they're super light and comfortable. And there's like a lining in there that I didn't think I'd like, but yeah. it actually makes them even more comfortable. Yeah, the real lightweight feeling. Super lightweight. Yeah, that's why. So I, I, Sunday there's, joggers. They're light years ahead of everybody. I'm telling Sunday you. Sunday joggers and meta pants are my favorite. Yeah. But these right here are even a thinner and lighter material. So if you want something that's like re really breathable, like I could see myself going to a wedding and then putting like a nice shirt on with them, them and like, yeah, wearing them Love somewhere them. where I can Love dress them. it up a little bit. Dude, I got to tell you guys uh, about a challenging situation that I just recently had. So you guys know I, my, my son went up to college, right? So that was hard because he's out of the house, moved sure. out. Yeah, it's the first full week, yeah? First full week was last week. And, you know, mm -hmm. I talked to him and, you know, he seems like he's having a good time and I'm like, oh man, I miss my kid. He's not, you know, he's not around or whatever. And then I get a call from him uh, yesterday during the day, which is weird because he's not the one that calls. We're the one that calls him typically. But he calls me and he's like, hey, he goes, uh, I'm really sick right now. I'm like, what? Like for him to call me, I'm like really scared. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I, I got a fever. I don't know what's going on, whatever. Turns out he got COVID, mm. uh, which is flying right now. But I, so I'm texting him back and forth and I'm door dashing him like supplements and stuff that he, he has to take. And he's doing the whole thing. And at seven, like at, I don't know, 650 or something, he took some ibuprofen because he's, he's, he felt like his fever, he had a fever. So I'm like, take some of this. It'll help you get to sleep. We're texting. And then I send him a text at 730. No response. And I can see when he's read it, didn't read it. Send him another text, no response. Bro, all night, dude, I have my phone next to me. <laughs> I have my phone next to me. And it was like on, just waiting. And then this morning I called him, he didn't answer at 8 a.m. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like low key into panic mode, right? right? And I'm like, he's got roommates, he's in a dorm, but there's this feeling that, you, you know, cause I'm not yeah. there. And I'm low key panic. And then he finally called me back and he's, he's you know, right. the he was just sleeping, but I'm like, oh. The funniest part about <laughs> the you. Worst, dude, the worst, dude, cause he's out of reach. Yeah. About you telling me that story is that, you know, that's an inevitable thing that was going to happen sooner or later. Of right? course. Sooner or later, but that you just don't think about like that moment when that's going to happen. Like I had never once crossed my mind when you were like saying goodbye to your son and he's now off to college. Like, okay, of course it's going to have its own different challenges and it's going to be hard and difficult. It's like, Oh boy, wait till the first day he's really sick and you're not oh. there. Can't be there. I'm like, Oh, and you know how I am with yeah, illness anyway. Course. I already freak out anyway. Yeah, you're my kids already are over the top. <laughs> so I'm like, Oh, it was terrible. And I was really trying hard not to like, <laughs> freak out yeah. call the door so I'm like alright he's probably sleeping so and on the way here I'm literally low key like controlling the panic because I know logically like I'm, I'm freaking out I shouldn't need I don't need to I'm fine everything's fine and I'm like kind of panicking and then I get the call that he's okay burst of ex an explosion of energy came yeah. out yeah he's fine he came in here had a good workout ready yeah. to work <laughs> hadn't I got a call back dude oh my god man it's, it's uh it's going around right now it is Katrina's family's got three people that have it she obviously just recovered uh from it like it's definitely going around yeah. I saw some school in Kentucky shut down already I hear the like they're starting to ramp up some of the they better not do the protocols I, the, the old ones I think a school shutting down for a day or two that's normal uh, procedure they'll do that with like the stomach flu or certain yeah. viruses but if they try the whole like flatten the spread no sorry we know that doesn't work and that's terrible so i didn't know that was a i never had a school shut down because of a flu some schools will do that for like stomach viruses or really? yeah if they start to spread really fast if uh, then they'll they'll shut down for a day or two it's not common but they'll they'll do that if it starts to get out of control because then what'll happen is you'll lose half the you know, half the school. Yeah, it'd be but, nice to see if we went back to our old sort of protocol of like, if you got symptoms, you just stay home. And then that's it. That's the end of the discussion. You mean discussion. common sense? Yeah. I know. Like that, that would just be it. If remember, I don't feel good, I guess i Remember when they home. told us you had COVID if you had symptoms or if you had no symptoms? Hmm. Looks oh, like you always have COVID. You could test yourself, come back negative, you could still have COVID. So you probably <laughs> not do anything for that. Well, yeah. I don't even know if I want to bring this up because it's so <laughs> negative. <laughs> I'm just, I was so pissed off this morning uh, researching a bit more about that lab that they discovered in uh, California. California, a Chinese run lab. Did you know that? No. So, yeah, I heard him start out in Fresno. They had infectious and diseases then, in there and weird shit in there. And it was so no regulated. This all happened when? When? This is like maybe a few months ago or a month ago. Yeah, months ago. This was a, yeah, this was recently that was, it was running 
um, with without a, a license, and so it was running underneath the radar. Uh, but before that, it had been running legally, uh, you know, previous. And this was like even a couple years before COVID even started. Uh, and so they they actually like went through and then assessed. Uh, and found like all of this like contagious diseases and things that they'd been experimenting with. And um, <laughs> isn't that great? Which is like, <laughs> let's just just sit back. Maybe it was all like, okay, it was managed and maybe it was like something that was like legally they're, you know, okay with it. But that was literally in our backyard. So when I hear something like that, it's, it's so hard to do this, right? It's so hard to remove yourself from what's happened in the last three years or four years now, right? And go like, if I heard that news five years ago or six years ago, would you be like, even, that's weird. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, and would you care? And would it just be like, like it's a bio lab. Like I, there's, there's some of those around, right? They're, they're yeah. obviously they're trying to yeah. like create but vaccines or whatever. And so is, is, is the, the alarmist like, what the fuck? Like, because of what we just have gone through or is that really like a, what the fuck well, type of situation? Well, first of all, if you're working on infectious diseases and you're not being heavily <laughs> monitored, that's yes. dangerous. Dangerous. You could take a disease and uh, use gain of function uh, procedures where you make it easily transmissible or, you know, just easy to infect you. And you can turn, I mean, coronaviruses are basic cold viruses, but because this one was obviously engineered to be more infectious, it, it caused more problems. Like you could do that with a lot of things. Like there's lots of viruses that are innocuous that if they, if they were changed a little bit could become very, very bad. Yeah. So that's bad alone, but in the, like, you know, in the rear view mirror of, or, or in the, I should say looking forward based off of what we just went through, it sounds even more insane to me. Yeah. And it, in China of all people doing that, that's crazy. Yeah. And it's it is a Chinese run uh, operation. It, it's being investigated right now, and they finally got granted access to kind of look at their handlings and everything. But yeah, it was it was literally illegally run, and there was all kinds of like mishandlings involved with it. So it's it's a bit of a red flag, just to say the least. That's crazy. Yeah, that is That's, weird, I dude. I know that is so weird. Speaking of red flags, I had another experience with this with another family member. Don't you guys love to have a big family? <laughs> I can do all this stuff. <laughs> um, it makes me think to myself, looking back, how many times I missed this. So I have my brother-in-law and he does jujitsu and he's like, he gets so fatigued. He's like, man, I got wasted. I don't know what's going on. Um, I talked, I talked to him about his diet. I'm like, okay, we got to increase your calories, this, that, and the other. And then I said, you don't eat processed food? He goes, no. And I'm like, do you, how like, much salt do you use? He's like, well, I salt my food. I'm like, do you add anything? He goes, no. So I sent him some element and I said, drink a packet before and then during. He's like, he goes, bro, he goes, it's, I don't know what you gave me. He goes, but it changed everything. It was literally, he wasn't having, that's it. He goes, it fixed everything. Is he still cycling too? Because he no. used to ride his bike. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Just jujitsu. Oh, okay. So, to, I wonder how many clients I missed where you're trying to figure out what the energy oh, problem I is. I 100% and, missed that. I 100% mm -hmm. missed that. Because remember- And you'll know when right we, away. When, we came, up, when totally. we came up as trainers, you know, this is tying into your- You never opening, told people to increase their salt. Yeah, your opening, your opening point about government telling us that, you know, salt and sodium yeah, is bad for us. Their blood pressure is going to go through the roof. So I never that. would have told a client- uh, I wouldn't even look Not there. only that, like- I would actually probably, I'm all guilty of this, like a client going like, is it okay if I use seasoning or salt? And me going, yeah, just go go light on I it. Know. Yeah. yeah, I probably said shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Like we, that's how much it was even ingrained in me that, oh, we, you know, be careful, sodium, be careful, be careful. Not thinking like, oh, I just got this client who probably ate fast food, you know, damn near every meal or every other day or type of deal. And now all of a sudden they're eating all whole foods mm -hmm. and I'm not adding any salt to their diet that they could be deficient. The first time yeah. this, uh, that I learned about this wasn't even me. It was this, uh, wellness individual that worked with me in my studio. And I had a client that was triathlete and she overheard this conversation that we kept having about his energy and how it was low. And I'm like, maybe we need to bump your carbs. Maybe you're overtraining this and that. And then she says, Hey, you mind if I pipe in a little bit? So yeah, absolutely. And she goes, do you, do you eat processed food? And he goes, no, of course not. I'm super healthy. She goes, do you like add a ton of salt? Do you take electrolytes? He goes, no. She goes, take some Himalayan pink salt and put some of it in your water. And he goes, put salt in my water. And he goes, yeah, he came back like the next week. And he's like, bro, huge difference. That was the first time I got clued into 
this particular thing and how big of an issue it probably is for a lot of athletes and fitness enthusiasts and health-minded individuals. It's like, you, it, and I'm, at, I'm at the point now where if you're a health-minded individual that works out a lot, you don't eat heavily processed foods, this is the point I'm at now. You probably need to add some kind of sodium to your diet. Well, mm -hmm. I, I yeah. think this also speaks to why the company's blown up. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's it's one thing that, okay, this that some people would benefit from this. It's another thing when a majority of people will. And so I think that's what's happening. I think a lot, it's not a huge expense. It's also something you can just test out yourself. Even if you don't have element on you, you can pick, put some salt in your water. And if you all of a sudden you notice like, oh shit, like that makes a big difference. Like, oh my God, like this is something I need. That's the key. It's a, it's a very inexpensive product. It, you would know right away. So if you think it's sodium, you could test it yeah. and you'll know within the first time or two that you use it. It's not something you take for weeks to see if it works or not. So have you guys uh, ever heard of this doll that's uh, supposedly is like, like a, is cursed? No. It's called Robert the doll. What? Apparently, I, I, I don't know if this. it's loosely based off of like Chucky, like the movie Chucky might be based off of this, but apparently, I, I forget what part of uh, America that uh, it, it existed, but it's like this really creepy kind of sailor looking doll. Uh, and apparently, like there was, um, I guess, I guess somebody like way back in like the 20s or 30s, like had this doll and um, the servant had performed some like voodoo or something on this doll. I read about this a long time ago. Like I remember her now. child had had died and and then she had placed this curse on this like doll. And it, this doll would like so this kid started talking to this doll. This doll was like talking to him like all the time. And it became this kind of weird uh engagement that they had and this friendship that they had between the two of them. Uh and then he grows up and he kind of leaves. He comes back and That's he still has right there. this this relationship with this doll. And uh weird things start happening. And uh anyways, it became such a, a phenomenon that like all this the next person that owned the house had same interactions with the doll. The doll was like, had all these like paranormal things to go with it to where they actually like encased this doll in some like museum. And it, it has all these rules. Like you have to like, you have to ask permission to take a picture of it. Uh, you have to say hello and you have to say goodbye and all these things. Otherwise, like you, you, you suffer the curse and the wrath. Uh, and there's like thousands of examples of people writing letters and they put all these letters there to, to ask forgiveness because they didn't follow those rules because they got like boils. They got like rashes. They got like uh, the people dying around them. Bro, there's got, a Wikipedia on it. It's yeah. so big. It's it's like this weird, crazy, like, like thousands Dude, of people have experienced its, its curse. It's you, in a museum in Key West, Florida. There's oh, a Key picture. West, that's right. Yeah. There's a picture Doug has of all of, of it with all the letters around it. That you just, you just, you just reignited an old fear I had. I watched an episode of The Twilight Zone with yeah. a, with a vent ventriloquist and a, and a talking dummy, and the dummy eventually became the the ventriloquist, and the ventriloquist turned into the doll, <laughs> and then he the, and then he shut him in the case, and at the end of the it, this is the twist in it. Yeah, it's the ventriloquist, and he's using and he's he's making the guy speak, but the guy is the doll now. It was a weird, and as I saw that when I was way too young, so uh -huh. it just it freaked me just out, dude. You, uh, yeah, so I don't have I have a thing with dolls. So. Oh wow, yeah, yeah that's it's creepy, a, dude. It's a creepy looking. Burn doll. it. Why don't you just burn it with fire? Oh, I know why they're making money off of it. That's why. Yeah. It reminds me. <laughs> yeah, it's it too, reminds me too of like profitable. The, remember what was that myth? Uh, do you guys remember that Brady Bunch episode? I'm gonna date myself a little bit. Remember the one where they go to Hawaii? Yeah. And they take like a lava rock or something or something, and it's cursed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they get it cursed. They have to go I back to Hawaii to bring it back. Yeah, reminds me of like stories like that. Yeah, it's something. But like, why are you gonna make that? Uh, I guess like you go see it and like, what, what's the point of like uh, berating it and like go, people are like testing it to see if it's like a real thing or not. It's like, what do you like? Why? Yeah. Like what's, what's even, Just why are you going to test your don't. fate like that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, crazy. it's hilarious. I know. All right. I'm going to give someone a shout out. She doesn't need one. She's obviously super popular, but knows her, but Danica Patrick, she's got a great podcast actually that dives into is, a lot of very interesting information. Is it geared towards mostly health and fitness or she go all, all the stuff that she's interested in? So spirituality, health and fitness. Uh, oh, so it's a very, per theories. it's a very personal type of podcast. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, okay. That seems pretty cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, very cool. cool. What, do you know the name of the podcast I, by chance? This is, no. Oh. Damn it. <laughs> <Don't know. laughs> I'm a What a jerk. <laughs> My bad. But you can find it very easily, I think, if you just look up her name.
Look, there's a company called 8sleep. It's the most intelligent sleep system you'll find anywhere. Now, what this does is it controls the temperature of your bed and it matches it to your uh, sleep cycles, uh, how you're moving, what's the best temperatures for your body to optimize all the different stages of sleep. It's literally a game changer. And if you go through our link, you get a $150 off the pod cover. It's 8sleep, 8 is spelled out, so 8sleep.com forward slash mind pump. By the way, they ship to the US, Canada, the UK, some countries in Europe, and Australia. So go check them out. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Sarah from Virginia. Hi, Sarah. How can we help you? Hey, so uh, first off, I know this probably sounds like a broken record, but thank you guys for everything that you're doing. Um, I feel like I've been listening to your podcast for a couple of years now. And it's just super refreshing, like your whole, everyone's point of view on everything is super refreshing, especially from a female perspective. So thank you. Thanks for everything y'all do. Um, so I'm four weeks postpartum with this little dude. Uh, it's my second baby. And I really just want to figure out how to handle postpartum recovery the best way. So I've weightlifted for, I don't know, at least eight years, like consistently. Before that in college, I kind of slacked off and then prior to college, all through school, I did like multiple sports a season. So I feel like my body is really used to working out and sports and all of that. Um, and I have a good amount of muscle. I worked out weightlifted all through pregnancy and I'm trying to figure out the best way to like transition postpartum. I don't want to do too much where I'm, you know, hurting myself. Cause I'm the type of person that will just work out every day if I let myself. Um, so right now I'm walking about 45 minutes a day with him just trying to do it like a 17 minute mile walk. Um, that's about my pace. And then, um, I'm just doing core and pelvic floor rehab type stuff. Um, so I'm just wondering what the best way is to, and when to like transition back into weightlifting and then also wondering about protein and creatine. Excellent. Well, right. well, well, um, First off, you're in a, an amazing position because yep. of your background and because you worked out through pregnancy. But uh, I have to ask this, by the way, are you cleared for exercise now? I haven't had my postpartum checkup yet. I have that on September 11th. So. Okay. At week six. Yeah. Probably. As soon as you get cleared, uh, and that's obviously we have to say that, um, then the getting back to strength training for someone like you is going to be really easy because of your background, because you were consistent during pregnancy. Um, mm -hmm. The key is this, uh, underestimate your abilities as much as you can when you get into it. Because the biggest mistake I see people like you make, which I've trained women like you where they're, they work out before they get pregnant, they work out during pregnancy, then they take the required time off, then they get back into it. And almost everybody overdoes it at first because they overestimate their you know, kind of where they're at with their bodies. So I would go mm -hmm. super easy. Like literally the first two to three weeks, your goal should be just to go through the motion, just to do the exercises and kind of wake things up. You're training with a, at, at most a moderate intensity, nowhere near high intensity, and then just kind of feel things out. You already said something that I was going to ask you, which is, are you doing any pelvic floor uh, rehab movements. Um, that's the most important thing. Cause the, the, the other side, the other risk is people get back into strength training and depending on how they had the baby, um, there could be like, if it was C-section, there could be things you need to look at. If it was vaginal birth, then there's pelvic floor muscles that, um, you know, you would need to make sure that they were okay because you could cause more problems exerting yourself with certain exercises. But so long as you're doing that stuff, I mean, we have a great program that I think would be a great program to start with, MAPS Starter. Mm -hmm. But for someone okay. like, yeah. So, do you have that, by the way? No, I just have Anabolic. Uh, I'll send you MAPS Starter because I think that's a great yeah. program to get back into it. But honestly, um, it's going to be about going slow and underestimating your ability um, and not trying to work out, quote unquote, but rather go through the motions and start that way so you can get a feel of, of where your body's at. Yeah, and I yeah, I just want to add to that. Um, I've had clients too go through that same process, and they're if they worked out before that, which is you know there's a benefit to that in terms of like your recoverability and being able to kind of get back after it, and you're going to feel strong again 
pretty quickly. It's just the, to, to be cautious with that and to, to really focus on stability and balance and, and restoring a lot of that uh, bracing that, that you need when you start adding load. So that's why it's starter is such a, a good follow-up kind of a program after this um, to, to address a lot of those stability needs. Uh, so that way too, you know, you're building off of that good foundation going forward and not just getting back into like your, um, you know, your regular routine. So you really address that first. I think the hardest thing is going to be the mental part, right? It's just you uh, wanting to do more when you don't need to. And uh, you're in the very similar position as Katrina was, worked out all through college, uh, was in pretty good shape, trained through her pregnancy, was in good shape. And then this was the only time she really took off was the six weeks postpartum. And we did starter. I don't even think we finished starter, although you could totally go all the way through it. I think she got about a month and a half in when she was like feeling really good again. And then we jumped the maps anabolic after that. But I did have to constantly tell her that as she was going, like she thought she could always do more. And I'm like, just because you can do more, it doesn't matter. Remember what I, and she obviously knows that I'm constantly preaching to her that the goal is to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. You haven't been doing anything for six weeks, hon. So you doing any exercise, any sort of movement is going to elicit change in the right direction. And so take advantage of that while you can. The fact that you could do body weight squats and you're going to see change in results from that because you haven't been doing that for over six weeks. So whatever in your head you think you can do, do less. And that would be my recommendation for at least a good solid month to two months afterwards. And then you could probably start to ramp things up. But you're in a great position right now that what you did leading up to this, uh, you'd be surprised how quickly the body will respond and you'll get right back at it. And then my experience with I think I, I think I read that you're, you're breastfeeding, too, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yep. one, of, one of the things that Katrina loved was the amount of calories that she could consume <laughs> while she was breastfeeding and training. She was like, I can't, she's like putting on weight was actually challenging, uh, uh, after her six weeks. So, uh, that's one of the things that can be to your advantage and nice. Yeah. I, I just yeah. can't, I just can't stress enough, Sarah, though, go real easy. Um, because you're, you're not used to your body at the moment. You're, you're, mm -hmm. it's, it's a different body. You, you had it after your first child. So you get kind of an idea there, but your idea of how you move and how you feel and how things connect when you exercise are based off of, you know, your years of exercise that weren't postpartum or even during pregnancy. So just like with pregnancy, when you were pregnant, you probably felt through the workouts a little bit. That's kind mm -hmm. of where you're going to start. Now your question about protein and creatine, let's start with creatine. Uh, now to date, there are no studies on creatine and breastfeeding mothers. So I can't recommend it to you. Um, I can only tell you my personal opinion. I am not a doctor, but creatine is found in food. Um, I would think that it would probably not only be safe, but probably beneficial. I know there's creatine deficiency syndromes in infants that can happen, and they've speculated that would be a good supplement to give moms during breastfeeding. But it, mm. you would have to check with your doctor. It's totally, and again, there's zero research, so I have no idea. Yeah. I'm just, you know, giving you my opinion. Now, as far as protein intake is concerned, what I, I the, the thing with, while breastfeeding and during pregnancy, because the question is always like, how should I eat? If you stick to whole natural foods, eat until you're satisfied, you're going to reach the right amount, whatever that is. And if you start your meals with protein, you're going to hit your right, your protein intake. Are you eating animal sources of protein, like red meat and stuff like that? Yeah, I've been tracking my protein. I did it through pregnancy because I had preeclampsia with my first oh. and I read that I protein can is like one of the only things I can personally do to help prevent that the second go around and I didn't get it. So I don't know if that helped, but I was used to eating a gram per body weight during pregnancy. So I was eating, you know, a lot higher protein. So right now I easily hit that mark and usually go above that. And I'm hung I'm so hungry. <laughs> like <Yeah>. I <laughs> hit thousand calories a day. Um, I've just been tracking it to track my protein to make sure I'm still hitting that mark. So I don't know if I should go above that because I mean, I'll eat 3000 calories and still be hungry some days. So yeah. Yeah. Good Sarah, I would it literally Feed, just eat, yeah, eat, eat until you're satisfied, eat. focus on whole natural foods. You're not going to go wrong between breastfeeding and then you starting to reintroduce weight training. Yeah. Like it's going to go to good yeah. use. Yeah. Eat, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about yourself. now if you eat processed foods, this is where things can get kind of weird because yeah, then you, you can overeat or whatever. But if you're eating like literally whole natural foods, I would yeah. have I would have it available and you eat until you're satisfied. Just eat until you're satisfied. It is like a whole 
green bread sandwich is like the worst food I ever eat. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're, you're totally fine. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't worry about it with your background and what you've been doing. You're, you're, li- you're on track. I, there would be no issues whatsoever. If you were my client, I wouldn't tell you to track anything. I would say eat the protein first would be the only thing I would say. Mm-hmm. And then just eat as until you're satisfied um, whole natural yeah. foods. By, by, the, by the sounds of it, you'll have the same challenge I think as Katrina did. You you probably have, you sound like you you get after it and you're dialed in. So like that is overreaching. That's probably the the thing that is, that will probably drill home the most with you listening to you. Just this little bit of time we've had with you is that you're going to want to do more and you, you won't need to. So how, how much weight did you gain uh, at your peak during pregnancy? And then how much of it have you lost so far? I gained 34 pounds and I've lost all but Five, you're fine. Five or six. Yeah, Sarah, you're good. So, yeah, you're good. so for people watching, uh, you know, and you can obviously this is for you too. Um, you're an example of what strength training will do for pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Um, it really keeps things in check. It ramps up your metabolism. You lost almost all the weight, and you haven't really started working out yet. Um, and you're going to bounce back very quickly. I mean, you're four weeks out. They say wait six weeks. Now, I, of course, you have to listen to your doctor, but you know I've trained clients who did strength training and they went to the doctor and they're like, I feel like I'm ready now. And the doctor has some experience with athletes and says, well, we could start. You could start with light extras because they were so strong you know, going, uh-huh. going into and during the pregnancy. So this is a great example of, of the benefits of it and how it really protects the body against the challenges from, uh, from pregnancy. So, so good job there. But we're going to send you starter because I think that's a great program to start with. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah, that's my problem. I feel like I could go like run a triathlon right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's gonna yeah, be your challenge. Yeah. Your challenge is gonna be no. that I just wanted to do yeah, too you're much. Probably feeling real good right now. Yeah. I know when to when my body is telling me to slow down. I guess is that's the, gonna be the hardest part. It's literally yeah. this: underestimate, start slow, see how you feel the next day, the day after that, try it again. And then that's what's going to gauge. That's how you'll gauge the intensity of your workouts. But it's what's the big look? Look, if you do that, you're still going to get stronger over the next couple of weeks. So don't think mm-hmm. that you have to apply more intensity to get there faster. It's more than what you've done for the last four weeks or whatever, six weeks when you're ready. So go slow. Your body's going to respond so fast. If you overdo yeah. it, what you may find is joint pain. You, and you might find back pain because of core stability issues. You may yeah. kick back your pelvic floor exercise a little bit because the pelvic floor needs strengthening. So go really slow and it'll come back faster than you think. Okay. All right. Thanks for calling in. Sounds good. Good luck, Thanks Sarah. So much. You got it. Thanks. Dur- during uh, Katrina's, so the doctor told us that six weeks we started at four. Uh, even though the doctor told us. Otherwise. Well, yeah, because she was, I could tell she was moving. I could tell she was fe- feeling so good. And I, and obviously she's got me by her side. So like I was the one who was tell- instructing her what to do. And we did a lot of st- like floor bridge work and stuff like that. And uh, when I would tell her what to do exercise wise, I remember her being like, I- I- this is too easy. Yeah, so, and yeah, I'd be yeah. like, just tell me, watch how you feel tomorrow. And then she, the next day she's like, oh, wow. She's like, I was actually sore from that. Yeah. I'm like, that exactly. I'm like, yeah. that's all you need to do right now. We just just need to let's start moving. Set the gears of motion. Yeah, let's just start doing some of these exercises, some isometric holds, things like that. Like, yeah, And it felt like it was nothing to her, but she was feeling it the next day. So, she, so that was nice that she made that connection of, wow, I could do this little and my body's actually getting sore and responding to it. I said, yeah, so we're going to do that. And then by, I think we did start her for a month or a month that sounds about right about, yeah, f- about four to six weeks with yeah, a fit person. yeah about a month or so and then she was like really feeling good and she was like i'm ready to get back into either anabolic or aesthetic and i couldn't remember if we jumped to anabolic or aesthetic but she was like right back in it going yeah through. dude mm-hmm. my first experience with this uh this is when as a trainer i really saw the disparity between um strength training and other forms of exercise i, I managed enough gyms to have lots of uh, you know group x instructors and female trainers working for me. After about after witnessing for about the third or fourth time, I realized there was a trend here where I would have these group X instructors. Very, they're fit. They exercise all the time, but it's cardio-based, right? It's all cardio. They'd have a baby. They'd come back, and I'd watch the progress and how they bounce back. Then I'd have these female trainers that were super into strength training, and the bounce back was like, it was crazy. It was like half the time. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. so crazy. And after I saw three or four times that going through, I was like, oh, it's, the strength training is way more effective at protecting your body against that. So that's what she's, that's what Sarah was doing. So she's going to right. Yeah, track. She, she's going to be good. Her biggest challenge. I could totally tell is going to be, she's going to want to do more. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Our next caller is Richard from California. Richard, what's up, man? How can we help you? 
Hey guys. Um, hey, I, I've been following your show for like three years now. Um, I really love it. Uh, you guys changed my whole perspective on uh, weight training and, and fitness. So I just want to thank you for that. You got um, it. Yeah. So I, uh, my, my question today is about rate of um, progression on, um, on the weights. And so um, I, I think it might help to give a little bit of background um, on like where right. I've been. So um, I'm 44 right now. Um, and uh, I've been relatively healthy most of my life. Um, but until I met you guys, um, I basically only did like uh, body weight training, which I'm not a heavy guy. Like I, the most I ever weighed was like 150. Um, this morning, my scale said 129. Um, but like in 2020, um, I decided to go on a cut and, uh, I, I was all into that intermittent fasting thing. And then, so my body weight dropped down to 123, uh, 10% body fat. And, um, I looked fine, but I didn't feel like really good. And I think my hormones are all out of balance. And so then I met you guys and then, you know, you really emphasize strength training. So I really got on that bandwagon. And so I, I got anabolic. Um, I've been through it like three times and, um, I've been really trying to up my, um, strength on, you know, the five by fives. I, I use that as my kind of scorecard as to like how much muscle I'm building, you know, something consistent where I can look at the compound lift. So I mainly look at like the front squat, um, the overhead press, the bench press, um, and the, uh, the deadlift. So, so those are the four things I track. I do it on the five by five. And then, um, so I, I do anabolic and I tap on those and I really want to increase my strength on that. Um, I'm sort of feeling like I max out. Like I'm, I'm happy if I can like put on a two and a half pound plate on each side at this point, like once a month. Um, and it, it's like every time I, I go up like two and a half, like five pounds on, you know, any of these lifts, like I basically have to go down to four reps versus five. And I, I don't know. Like, is that normal or not? Or what should I do at this point? Well, two things. So, if you added yeah. five pounds to a lift once a month, that would be like 60 pounds on a lift in a year, which is ex exceptional. <laughs> so that's, that's really good. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could do that. So, so, okay. So the question, cause you, you, you wrote out basically, you don't know if you're progressing too slow or what the mm -hmm. natural limit is. Uh, where did you start? with some of these lifts? Cause you ran through MAPS anabolic three times. So let's say mm -hmm. when you first did MAPS anabolic, I don't know, where was your deadlift versus now? Where was your bench press versus now? Like how, how far? Yeah. Did you yeah. So, uh, my, my deadlift started at, uh, 25 pounds on each side. So that was a 95 pound, okay. um, on the deadlift. And, um, right now I'm at 200, but mind you, this, this is like, uh, since 2021. So, I've been, you know, at this for, for two years now. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy that I can do a 200 pound five by five right now on a deadlift. But, um, yeah. And then like, you know, your, your other question, like we're like where I'm at right now is like with the front squat. Um, I'm at 170 on a five by five. I started on, uh, I think I, I think I started most the, the squats and the deadlift at 95 pounds, 25 plates on each side. And then the overhead press, man, that was hard when I first started. I think I was, uh, I, I'd be happy if I could put 10 pounds on each side. And right now, um, I, I'm kind of maxing out at 105 by five. Yeah. You're, I mean, yeah. you're, you're doing, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. Um, the, what I would look at would be diet. Yeah. Uh, and I would, you know, are you, do you know how many calories and grams of protein you're eating? Yeah. So that's another thing I really want to thank you guys on. Cause I, I eat a lot more now. Um, and I'm happy about that. Uh, I, I try to get in like 2,500 calories a day. Um, and then I try to do, uh, 0.8 grams of protein per body weight per pound body weight. Yeah. So that, that's where I'm at right now. I would bump the protein a little more, yeah. um, and the calories a little more. You sound like you have a really fast metabolism. <clears throat> what is that? Was that fair? Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Bumping the calories will make a big difference. Changing the program will be good too at yeah. this point. In fact, because you've done anabolic three times, I think the new program that we just put out would be really good for you to go through. And then you can go back through MAPS Anabolic and see if you've made any improvements. Because MAPS Anabolic mm -hmm. is very effective at building strength and muscle, but it's very 
focused on a single plane of movement and it's very bilateral. There's no mm-hmm. lateral stability work. There's no rotation. And sometimes, especially after been doing, you've been doing it for a year or two, the limitations come from weak links in the chain um, is, is where sometimes these weaknesses come from, or should I say plateaus come from? So your deadlift may be plateauing because lateral stability issues could be an issue. Overhead press mm-hmm. could be plateauing because of shoulder stability issues. And the body does that. It'll it'll prevent you from getting stronger um, because it it fears getting injured. So mm-hmm. I think MAPS old... And now you have a background in body weight training. I think you would appreciate old time strength. I think if mm-hmm. you if you followed that, I think you would really appreciate it. I would do that, and then I would, and we'll send that to you. And I would do that in a bulk, and then at the end uh, after that, go back to Maps Anabolic, and I wouldn't be surprised if a couple weeks in, you hit new records in, in all those lifts. Yeah, I, I also want to highlight that one um, percent of one percent of gains is, in the right direction is still awesome. I mean, that's mm-hmm. so here in the in reality, a lot of people have setbacks. I mean, it's very normal for me to be training for six months to a year. And within that year, I see, you know, some regression in some things just because of life or I've been practicing that movement. Like, so to see pretty much you've gained consistently uh, across board, even if it's small and incremental, that's still awesome. I mean, that's, what, that, that's a, a sign of like, you're doing a lot of the things right. Like if you were mm-hmm. under eating and missing your protein consistently and stuff like that, and then you're scratching your head, you're like, I don't understand. I've been doing this consistently and I'm, I'm getting weaker. Or I'm, I've plateaued. I'm not getting any stronger in any of these lifts. Like then it, it's a clear sign of something's off. But the fact that you're still progressing uh, on all these things, even if it e- is small, is a sign of you doing a lot of the things the right way. So I do agree with Sal that mm-hmm. you're at a point now too where I think you would you greatly benefit just from a, a complete program flip up. I wouldn't have gone maps old time direction, but I think that's totally fine. I think that's I think the challenge you're going to have with that is it's so unique that you won't know it's there's no baseline for you on a lot of those <laughs> movements. So it's like, am I doing good? Am I? Uh, that'll be kind of hard to measure. And then coming back will be great when you come back to like an anabolic. I would have moved you to performance and aesthetic in that direction. That's the direction I would have gone because I think you're you're due for something like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, because I see that I see that uh, suggestion. I like that suggestion. But also, too, I was actually thinking more symmetry, just based on like addressing any kind of like instability. You know, unilaterally, you can kind of really highlight uh, what's going on in terms of like. Um, any of that lateral or, or uh, rotational stability that might be an issue. Uh, but what I do like about old time strength is, is the emphasis on grip and also to a lot of these like um, uh, big rotational stability components there that uh, don't get highlighted at all in anybody's programming. So again, I'm totally up for that and it's, it's very strength focused and heavy on strength. So you're you're definitely going to see some gains with that if you stick with it. One last thing too, and you, you kind of mentioned it about, having to drop sometimes to like four reps or like that there we we like we write all these programs is like a, a baseline for you guys but there's nothing wrong with you running like a a, a phase of like three by five you know mm-hmm. so or five by three excuse me where you're doing five sets and you're only doing three reps yeah and actually just getting your body used to stacking on an extra 25 pounds that you never would put on there because you're you're trying mm-hmm. to target five reps yeah so there's nothing yeah. wrong with doing like i when i started to train this was way later in my lifting career singles doubles and triples because i never identified as a power lifter and so even somebody that's a coach and trainer i was naive to this to think oh i wouldn't benefit that much from it i greatly benefited from running some cycles of just like singles doubles and triples especially when you're, mm-hmm. you want to get stronger and so it's it just getting acclimated to weights that you're not used to moving and you're uh, you can put on more weight because you know that you're not going to have to do five uh there's some real value to that so just keep that in mind as you're going through any of our programs that there's nothing wrong with you running a phase where you focus on singles doubles or triples i think you'll get a lot of value from that yeah keep this right. in mind too richard that uh the average person when they start strength training they're going to see a majority of the strength gains that they make within the first year to two. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the first half of that first year is when they're furious, fast strength gains. And then it starts to slow down and it continues to slow down. And by the third year or so strength gains are going to be very slow and they're going to be Mm -hmm. typically hard to 
They're going to be hard to achieve. And at some point they become risk versus, uh, the risk is higher than the reward at some point. I think you're still okay. You can keep pushing strength, but just, mm -hmm. just so you know, you've been doing this consistently for two years. Um, it's natural for gains to slow down, but you know, you, that comment you made about five pounds on a lift in a month. Holy cow. If at this point you could do that, I mean, you're you're adding 50 pounds to a lift or more, uh, every year. That's exceptionally fast strength gains. You know, after year three or so for most people, if I can get 10, 15 pounds on a lift at the end of a year, we're kicking ass. Oh, if you could just go forward, mm -hmm. it's very normal for all, yeah. all of us in here have had a year of seeing regressions in movements, you know, like, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm at every one of my lifts, you can go on the list. I'm weaker at all of them right now than and it's just part of the game as you've been doing it for a really long time. So it's okay, man. If you're, if you're going forward on all of it, I mean, that's a, that's a huge yeah. win. So. But I do think strong, excuse me, old time. And I do think mm -hmm. a bulk is going to be wise. And I think you're going to, you're going to see some, some cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, just to say like that's, you know, five pounds uh, a month, and that's like kind of history. Um, and this is why I, I wanted to talk to you guys, because I was like, I don't think that's going to happen this year. Like, I, yeah. I feel like, you know, this is starting to slow down. I, I can feel it. I'm like, really, I don't think I can like put on another five pounds this this month. So I wanted to talk to you guys about that. And given my age, I mean, I'm not, I'm not worried about I'm not age. old. Yeah. I, I'm not yeah. old, but I'm not. Uh, string chicken yeah, but either. here's your what you're highlighting right now actually does support Sal's decision to move you to old timey because here you will see five pound gains every month on some of these lifts because they're going to be so unique or faster because you're they're going to yeah. be so different. You're going to have to start really light when you first start off because they're going to be difficult just to perform the movement. And then as you get good at the movement, you're going to be able to start to stack on the weight and you're going to go through that kind of newbie gain feeling again. That's kind Great. of the, that's kind of the secret sauce yeah. and the magic of program design and actually doing things that are so unique and different than what you're used to is yeah, they suck at first and you're kind of weak at first, but then you get to, you get to feel those newbie gains again, where it's like, man, I'm, I'm putting weight on the bar almost every month and that's exciting and motivating. Mm -hmm. And so to that point, you know, Sal's recommendation with old timey that you're going to get to experience that again, because it is so different. I bet there's movements in there you've never done before, probably several, and because of that, you're going to, have to start really light, and then you're going to get to see yourself stack on the weight. You know, all transfer back. You know, once you go back, totally, to the blog, you'll see it. Totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, guys, thank thanks again. Um, yeah, you guys really uh, really changed my perspective on health, and I, you know, I can't thank you guys enough. So thanks, Richard. Um, really great work. Appreciate, Appreciate the support, it. Richard. Thanks, man. Old time is on your way. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, generally speaking, increased strength. There's like three buttons you can. There's there's obviously it gets much more nuanced, but there's three buttons you can push. There's bump calories, change your programming to where you're changing your reps and sets, schemes and tempo and stuff like that, or completely new exercises and very different programming. The more advanced I get, the more that third one becomes more effective. It's like when I'm beginner, when I'm training a beginner, it's like calories usually is the one that does it. Then the second one, but as you get more advanced. Like now I, you know, I, I'm doing different exercises. I go back to the old stuff and I'm stronger mm -hmm. and it's because there's weak links there that are, I, I can't address otherwise just period. Well, and, you know, to piggyback off of that also that point when I'm training somebody who's, who's very new, right. Say in the first year, I'm only going to move like one of those levers. Cause that's all I need to move. Yes. Yeah. And they're going to see that just bumping someone's calories. Boom. That's they're going to respond. Yep. Oh, just changing the rep set scheme. Oh, boom. They're going to respond. As you get more and more advanced, you've been doing this for, say, three years consistently. Now I can pull all three of those levers and really kind of totally. rock your world and so you see a big difference. Our next caller is Jody from Connecticut. Hi, Jody. How can I help you? Hey, guys. How, How are you? How are you doing, Jody? Hello. Um, thanks for all the great information you guys put out there all the time. I've been a fan for a couple of years, which is why I'm calling you to get some help. I am 62 and I am going to get back on stage to compete again. And I competed for 10 years, became a two-time world bikini champion at 49. And um, I'm concerned that my butt is not going to be where I need it to be by November. <laughs> so I know shows are won from the backside 
So I need your help. What are the best exercises for glutes? Jody, we, we can't, we cannot do this unless you're honest with us. Did you say you're 62? Can you, is that for real? Yes. Yes. For real. Holy cow. <laughs> oh, you're very sweet. What kind of filters on this camera? <laughs> you look exceptional. You're very sweet. Listen, you've been lifting weights for a long time. Okay. 40 years. O obviously. I mean, you look phenomenal. Um, and you Thank won you. some, yeah. So I mean, the, the bet we just talked to Brett Contreras. In fact, we just had him on the show. He's the butt yep. building guy. And he talked about training people who have a lot of experience, who've been strength training for a long time. And he basically is like, all of their lower body workouts are glute focused. And we may throw in some compound lifts like squats and, uh, and uh, leg press and lunges. He goes, but otherwise it is a lot of glute stuff. It's hip thrusts. It's all, it's like the, the back extensions with the focus on the glutes. It's glute machines. It's a uh, high volume. So it's heavy, high intensity exercises, but also low intensity, single joint exercises with lots of volume. And he's like, he, he took, he, in fact, he talked about some of his uh, competitors where they avoided, I mean, any direct, you know, quad work and it was all hamstring and glute and it was a glute focus. And that's when they saw the progress. And you're the perfect person for someone like that. Cause You've got such, you've already done so phenomenal. You've got such great muscle memory that, uh, there, I mean, it's, I wouldn't advise for the beginner to avoid certain things, but for someone like you, I think that that'll be the trick. Keep in, keep in mind too, Jody, that, you know, shows are also won in the off season and not in the prep. That's another thing I always tell my competitors is like, so, uh, one, what's, what's our time frame that we have before you actually start prep and are, do we have some good, t cause that, that when you. If you're going to apply the things that I'm going to recommend with the like Brett Contreras talked about, um, it does matter that we are in a bulk and we're building because, uh, you know, I, I could tell you all the greatest exercise in the world. If if you're in a calorie deficit in prep time, we're not going to we're not going to build any glutes in that in that phase. So what are we looking at time wise? So we are exactly 12 weeks out. I started a month ago mentally prepping and working lifting heavier. So for the past month, um, I've been thinking of it sort of kind of like 12 weeks out, but I knew that I had 16 weeks out. Um, so I've been trying to lift heavier. I was concerned about my shoulders being, I don't, I'm not a big person. I'm all of five feet tall and I weigh 103. So I'm not a big person, yeah. but so I didn't know how much I could actually lift. Um, so I was concerned about the shoulders too. So to answer your question, I am, I am prepping. So I'm 12 weeks out as of today. So that's the greatest challenge here is that there's not a lot that we're going to do right now. Well, there's nothing we can do right now to technically build your glutes. You could just try to prevent you, yeah. from losing. Um, Cause I, what I would have recommended is that we go on a bulk and we train hip thrust three times a week and probably squatting and deadlifting intermittently uh, in there also. So that it would be built around how much can I get that hip thrust up? And how much are we squatting when we started and how much are we squatting at the end of it? And that would be like the main focus of the programming, but it would have to be done in a bulk and us in a surplus of calories. Cause doing that in a deficit, you're just not, you're not going to build any additional uh, muscle at this point going in prep. You know what? I was thinking about that because I didn't, I felt my gut reaction was that I'm not going to be ready because how much can I build at this point? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily given my age, but just that I have, I had 16 weeks out. Um, I don't know if my coach just wants to throw me on stage and see how I'll do in the 60 and over but I just don't want to look like an idiot. I don't want to look like a fool. I oh. want to bring my best body. I, I don't think you're going to look like a fool an idiot. I, just, I think I, I think you're going to do fine. But it, I mean, there's there's two different things here, right? Say, I'm going to tell you that you're going to do just fine. You're, you're going to do well. I'm sure you'll do well. But if you were, if I was coaching you and you said, Adam, I, my, my main focus, you put me on that stage again. I want my ass looking right. And I want it looking better than it feel right now. Then I would tell you, I'd say, okay, well then I don't want to focus on a date yet for when the show is. Let's go build this ass. Let's get on a bulk. Let's let's and let's measure. Let's see and let's see the progress until you feel like, hell yeah, I feel a difference. I see a difference. And then I say, okay, now it's time to get ready for this show. Let's prep. Let's get lean. Let's get shredded and let's reveal all this hard work we've yeah. done. But that being said, if you're committed to going to the show and there and we're not going to postpone or do it another time, and you're you can at least the, the protocol would be the same. So like I still would be doing hip thrust three times a week like that with intermittently putting squats and deadlifts in there. I would still train you as if I was trying to build glutes. I just want to be transparent and honest with you. 
I'm not going to. I mean, I wouldn't lie to you as your coach and say, oh, don't worry. We're, we're going to get that ass this last, this last 10 weeks. It's like, no, you're in a deficit. Like you are, you're catabolic. We're not building shit right now. Yeah, right now this- it's maintaining and as much that's, as you can. That's how I was feeling. I was yeah. feeling, and that's why I reached out to Adam. I'm like, okay, I need, uh, what, what can you guys do to help me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, I, I, at this point, it's just trying to, uh, you're playing defense. You're trying to prevent I muscle know. loss. Yeah. But when you get back into the building phase, you're looking at, you know, probably 30 total sets a week of glute work. But of that 10 to 15 is the heavier stuff. And the rest is just volume and frequency and pump. And I, I went through your Instagram and you've got great quads. So I think you'd be totally fine sacrificing quad work for glute work. I don't think you'd have any. In fact, I mean, a lot of the glute works that include some quad. So you'd be totally fine. And I would do like a 12-week bulk and I'm trying to build my butt. And that's the focus. How yeah. strong can I get my hip thrust? Yep. Um, how strong can I get my sumo deadlift? And, you know, how much volume and, 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 you know, intelligent volume can I throw at my glutes? And then I take that volume away from other body parts. Don't make the mistake of just adding volume to all your workouts, but rather I'm going to do less quad work, more glute work. And that'll, that, otherwise you're just going to overwhelm your body with, with too much work. You're going to love the, the Brett Contreras episode. Cause it was like, I mean, a two hour episode primarily talking about ass. So okay. it'll, be, it'll be, I think I saw it and I just haven't listened to well, it. Well, no, yet. it hasn't gone live yet. Doug, oh, go, okay. Do we have it scheduled right now. Is it scheduled? Yeah, I believe it's going to be out in a week. Okay. So in a week it'll okay. pop out. So listen to that as far as like, but again, if we were, to, if I was coaching you, we would have done this pre-prep. Because come prep time, what I tell all my competitors was, this is where we reveal all the hard work we did in the off season, right? At yeah. this point, you're not building a, even though people think you're building a physique because you reveal this amazing physique after 12 weeks, you're just cutting down. You're just carving away and revealing all the work that you put into before. And so, yeah, most of that work would be done already by now. So, I mean, I think you're going to do fine no matter what. I think you're going to do more than fine, Jody. I think you look great. You're going to kill it. But if you want a protocol afterwards, I would say run a bulk and then listen to that episode where we talk everything about building glutes. Okay. Yeah, I think that sounds like maybe I just need to get my feet wet um, and see what it feels like. I'm also going to be competing in a different federation that I've never competed in before. Yeah. So it's an MPC. So okay. it's just... Um, well, well, there's a lot of value in that too, by the way. Okay. Yeah. So like a lot of coaches, I remember this was kind of the debate that I was going back and forth with my buddy who was a coach at the time. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to get up on stage yet. I want a whole year to build the physique. And he was like, no, no, no. He's like, just get up there and get your practice and be seen by the judges. He's like, I don't, it doesn't matter that you're not going to be the, bring the best version of yourself yet. Like right now you just need to be seen by these NPC judges and you want to get that practice in of what the whole, mm-hmm. the whole process is going to look like even though you have the process of cutting and stuff like that, but the process of actually going in and competing on the NPC stage, he's like, get that out of the way, get the judges seeing you out of the way, and then you can put that hard work in. So there is some value of you just getting up there, let them see you. If you plan to do this again after that, then oh, there, that, yeah. that is actually a smart strategy is to get up because you already have a good enough physique that you're going to do well, whether you win the whole thing or not on your first show or not. Well, that's a different story. And at least now the judges will see you, you'll get their feedback, and then you'll have a blueprint for what to go do and build in the off season. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, that all. And reach back to me. I'd love to hear how this goes. So I'll be watching. I I will let you know. Thank you so much. Yeah, good job, Jody. All right, Jody. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Everybody needs to look at her Instagram. She's looks I know. I cannot yeah. believe I remember when she interviewed me. I was like, I really thought she was lying to me. I was like, there's no way she's 16. she looks like a fit forty something year old. Yeah, she woman. Looks, she looks good for forty. And, and yeah. I mean, in her Instagram, she has lots of, and that's, I mean, she's obviously strength trained properly and done this for a long time because very balanced, very, I mean, healthy looking physique and, you know, competing. Um, I think your advice was great, Adam. I think, you know, test it out, see what happens. And then after that, you could focus on like a whole period of, of building, but she's so experienced with strength training that, um, you know, if she just did glute exercises for her lower body. She, her lower, her legs, her quads will probably look fine. I'm sure there'll be no change, but she would get the butt gains. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, part of why I wanted her to come on here so we could discuss this because I think it's actually a, a cool conversation because it doesn't just, apl- this doesn't, this doesn't just apply to competitors. This is a common thing yeah. that you hear clients yeah. want. Mm-hmm. They want to build this body. They want to build this ass. They want to build these arms. They want to build these shoulders. And then they also want to lose all this body fat. And it's like, okay, well, if we go on this cut where we want to reduce calories to lose the gut or lose the body fat, 
you're not simultaneously going to build a butt. You're not simultaneously mm -hmm. going to build shoulders. And of course, there's exceptions to the rule to an absolute newbie who's never touched weights that will see some progress in both ends. And what you see is an illusion. So when people think, oh, that's not true. I remember when I got shredded before and my shoulders were there. No, you all, you've you always had those shoulders. Yeah. You always had that ass. It just got, you always had those abs. Yeah, they just, it, they just got revealed. That's mm -hmm, all. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if you want to quote unquote build those muscles, then we have to be in a surplus. It's just science. You can't, you're not going to build it while your body is catabolic. Es especially when you're advanced. Now, sometimes yes. complete beginners can get away with being in a small deficit and see a build and lose process app at the same time. But at her level, unlikely. It's unlikely. She's already built so much muscle. She's trained for so long. Gaining muscle is going to be hard anyway, even in a surplus, let alone a deficit. It's going to be impossible. Yeah. If, if I was her coach and she came to me and said those things before we decided to do the show, the only reason why I would let her get on stage within 12 to 16 weeks now is because just purely for what I said, Hey, it, we're going to go, we're going to go after, let's say like her and I decide we're going to go after an uh, IFBB broke pro card. And so I know she's going to have a journey. It's not going to be one or yeah. two shows. Yeah, we're going yeah, yeah. to be doing at least three to five to maybe six shows for that even to be a, a possibility. Then I'm like, go do it just so we can, the judges can see you. We can get their feedback. And then the next prep or the next off season will we'll build the physique that I think is going to win. There's value in that. But if she was like, Adam, I'm going to do one show. I'm in my 60s now. I just want to say I, I did it one more time, and I want to bring the best body I can. Then I'd be like, okay, let's take our time then. Let's let's really assess. Let's talk about all your weak points, and then let's build an off-season where we're going to be in a calorie surplus. Let's go sculpt this body. That would have been a better approach if that if that was her desired outcome. Our next caller is Nicole from Massachusetts. Hi, Nicole. How can we help you? Hey, hey so I started listening a few months ago. And since then, you guys have completely transformed my relationship with food. Um, for the first time in my life, I'm eating in a bulk rather than a deficit. Nice. Um, right. So way more calories than ever. Still tough sometimes mentally, but I'm mostly okay with it because I know I'm putting on muscle. Finally starting to look like I actually work out. Um, so first, just want to really thank you for that. That's awesome. Thank yeah, awesome. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so I listen any chance I can. Um, I really couldn't find anything that got into a deload week. Uh, I even asked your AI to search for episodes, but I couldn't find anything that really got into detail there. So um, a little bit of background. I just wrapped up MAPS Aesthetic on Friday. Saw major results through the program. I hit some PRs in all the major lifts, and I'm just feeling super strong overall. Um, next I'm planning to run symmetry. I knew I had imbalances, but I really started to notice that while I was running aesthetic. Um, but I feel like my body is tired. Yeah. <laughs> so instinctively, um, I just think I would benefit from a deload week before I jump into another program. And I'm not really sure what that should look like. Okay. Um, that's a really good question. All right, let me ask you this. Let's go back for a second. You said we yeah. changed your relationship with food and then you finally went on a bulk, which was probably hard at first and maybe even now probably a little challenging. What yeah. are the benefits and effects you saw from the bump in the calories? Yeah, so I, um, I, I saw myself getting stronger um, and even just looking like I was getting stronger. So I, I did notice the scale go up, which was, um, still is pretty tough mentally. Um, but knowing that I, like I have goals, I want to chest press 135. I want to squat, um, 200 or, or more. Um, I want to get my deadlift up there. So I know that eating, fueling my body is going to get me there. Did you get more energy? Did you notice any changes in things like sleep and energy and motivation? Um, I, I think energy. Um, yeah. I'm not sure about sleep if that's, if it, if it really made a difference there, but I do think energy. Yeah. Good, good. So you trusted us and you saw some benefits and you look lean. Uh, I could tell from the, the camera here. So, and you're doing great. You're getting stronger. So I'm going to ask you to trust us again. That's where I'm getting at. Okay. Um, yeah. I think you, you would do well with a deload week before you start symmetry. So I would take a week off completely. You could still walk and be active, but I do no lifting for a week. Then after phase, not phase one, but phase two, I would do another week off. And then at the end of symmetry, take another week off and then do another program. 
Okay, so it would be one week off now or when you're ready to start symmetry, a week off after phase two, and then after symmetry is over, a week off, and then try another program. Now, here's what the data clearly shows. Not only is it good for you, but you're going to get better results doing it this way. You'll actually get stronger and get better results doing it that way. The only challenge is going to be the mental part of actually taking that week off. So I suggest you fill the time with something else that might feel productive. Um, and it could be anything. You can even be something active. I just wouldn't fill it with a hard workout. But you'll get better results doing it that way. It took me decades to figure this out. And when I finally did, it's like, okay, well, this this just I just feel better and I'm stronger and I'm getting better better results. There was a recent study that uh, we've talked about a few times on the show. It's probably been a while, so maybe you haven't listened to it if you just recently started listening to Mind Pump where they compared uh, two groups uh, where someone took off one group, basically trained all the way through. I think it was for like, I want to say three to six months, somewhere in that range. And they trained all the way through, no breaks, no deload, no nothing. Another group took off every fourth week completely. So, so like three weeks and then one week off. Yeah, three, every weeks, month. three weeks on, one week off. Three weeks on, one week off. So basically took a week off every single month. At the end of the study, the group saw the same amount of results. And so that was a that, that's a huge eye opener for most people. Like, wow, and that's way more deloads than I recommended. Yeah, to. and you don't need to do you don't necessarily need to do that all the time, but that just shows you how much like because the fear is like, oh my god, I worked so hard, I've made all these gains, I don't want to take a week off and like start all over again. Like, not only will you not start all over again, you're going to progress as much as the person who didn't skip at all. So there's, and, and, and if you keep your diet in check and you do active things like say, go for a hike or do some yoga or do some other beneficial things for you, I think you'll see tremendous benefit. And then the other thing to point out was your intuition. You felt it like no one knows I could be the best coach in the world, but no one knows their body better than yourself. And if you were feeling that way, it's a great sign just to scale back and deloading doesn't like, like people are always looking for like this, uh, for, protocol yeah protocol like for yeah. delo it could be as simple as like i'm gonna still train this week but i'm gonna cut everything i do 50 percent hmm. just gonna cut everything in half if i can squat 200 pounds i'm gonna squat 100 pounds if i normally do four sets i'm gonna do two sets and still cut it but just take it way easy for you or go hey i'm gonna go all body weight movements this week just no no weight no barbell no dumbbell just body weight movements or just doing maybe some stuff from our prime pro program like yeah. real that man huge benefits to doing that and so as you continue on this journey like when you have those moments and you feel that way listen to your body and then you know scale back for the week and it doesn't have to be like this perfect quote unquote deload protocol even though that study showed that they took weights off completely so you could get yeah. away with going completely off, or you can just dramatically scale back whatever it is that you're currently doing. Yeah, it's okay. really just active recovery at the end of the day. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be super specific to his point uh, in terms of a structured day. It, you know, just get out and and uh, that's where walks come in. And that's, you know, I like mobility practices just because then I can kind of see how well, like, my joints are responding, if there's any pain, any kind of restriction there. Um, just to go through those movements and plus to prep for then going into like unilateral work and things like that, going into symmetry, it's going to highlight a lot of that on its own, but, uh, really it's just about like the, the active recovery, the movement, the blood flow, and then, you know, feeding yourself and getting proper rest. Yeah. You, you know why Nicole, they have deload protocols No, because athletes tend to overdo it on deload weeks. So it's easier to tell them yeah. specifically reps they and need sets. Structure. Right. But really a deload week, you, you should just go have fun and, and do, and do nothing hard physically. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Just go have fun. Do nothing hard physically. I like mobility work a lot during that week. Uh, in fact, do you have maps performance? I do not. All right. I'm going to send that to you because in the program or mobility sessions, you can use those on your deload week. Just do the mobility okay. sessions oh, if you still yeah. want to go to the gym. I love that too. And if you're an outdoor person too, this is the week to, hey, I'm going to go yeah, hiking, kayaking, yeah. doing physical stuff that yeah. you like to do. That's just, okay. that's a great thing to do during yeah. that time. By the way, too. Adam said 50% weight. I want to be very clear. It also means you do the same amount of reps you did before with the half weight. Because some people will be like, oh, I'm going to cut the weight in half. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now I'm going to do twice as many reps. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> it's literally, if I did 10 yeah. reps with 200 pounds in the squat, I'm going to do 10 reps with 100 pounds. Yeah. 
in the squad. Yeah. yeah, good point. So okay. yeah, you, you, it's got to be super easy, and you're gonna go back. You're gonna you're gonna get. Here's the deal. I know Adam brought up the study. Uh, that's just showing you how neglig how how little negative effects you get from taking a week off after every three weeks. Doing absolutely nothing in this. Yeah, right. what I told you to do, you're gonna get re you're gonna get better results. So you're not taking that many deload weeks. You're literally doing one before symmetry, one after uh, phase two, not phase one, phase two, and then at the yeah. end of it, you take another week off and then follow into the program. That's gonna get you faster results. Not that you're gonna get the same results, but you'll get faster results. Would would you play with my calorie intake no. on a no. deload no. week? No, nope, no. Keep it the same. Same. Okay. And, okay. and also, don't stress. Don't stress it. I mean, understand that you haven't lifted weights for a week, so don't let yourself look at the mirror and go, "Oh God, I feel here's, like this." Yeah, I feel. Like just, here's scale. what happens. Here's what happens with the deload week when people, because here's what people try to do. They're like, "Oh, okay, now I'm not exercising as hard, so I got to cut my calories." Well, now you just reduce the effectiveness of the deload week because mm -hmm. what your body does during that deload and by the way i don't give deload weeks to people who have trouble making it to the gym so for someone watching right now who skips every other week or misses workouts all the time you're not doing a deload week you need to get your ass in the gym someone like you who's very consistent who has trouble when they don't go to the gym has tremendous benefits and then you need to continue to feed your body the same amount of calories because your body's going to use those calories to get you to recover and adapt. In fact, you may actually come back from your week off stronger. And in fact, I'll bet that you probably will. So um, yeah, follow it. Do it. Don't change your calories. Don't try to compensate. You won't gain body fat. Trust me. You're gonna, you'll, you'll come back stronger. You'll get better results as a, res as a result of this. All right. <laughs> All right. We're going to send you. I'm going to do it. I'm going to And we're sending, you, we're sending you performance so you have those mobility sessions, okay? Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Everything Nicole. Everything you guys do. Thank awesome. you. Thanks, Thanks you. Nicole. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you, you, you know, we mentioned the, the, the calorie compensation. It's funny because people will be like, oh, I'm deloading. I'm going to cut my calories in half. Well, yeah. now you just wasted right. time. Yeah. <laughs> now you're just not working out and you're not feeding your body. Uh, and it's not the purpose. Well, yeah. many times a lot of what that overtraining feeling is, is just not giving yourself adequate recovery. And part of the yeah. recovery process is feeding the body what it needs. That's and right, so totally. to, to go into a cut on your, on your deload week, well, it does, it like defeats half of the, the purpose of it. Yeah. You know, I do want to point out the worst part about the advice that we gave is that, especially since that on the show, we talk a lot about behavioral stuff. I think the hardest part about the advice of taking a week off is, a lot of us are momentum based yeah. and habitual. And so if you've gotten into this, you finally got on your, your fitness and you've been consistent and you're trying, and then here we are like, Oh, take the week off. It's like, and then all of a sudden that week turns into two weeks or three weeks or you spiral yeah. out of control. Or then all of a sudden you start eating like an asshole. And so I think it, the most important thing is to know who, what kind of person you are totally, and that if, if taking a week out of the, going to the gym and your routine is going to, is going to cause you to spiral. And then if that's the case, then I tell you to go still go to the gym. Just, just go easy. Just go way easy. Yeah. But way she's been easier. working out for 10 years consistently. Right. She's, right. Yeah, so yeah. someone like that, I think that is the right, but I just wanted to make that clear because I know there's a bunch of people in the audience who, you know, they hear that and they're like, oh shit, well, I just started my journey. I'm on three months right now and I haven't taken a week off yet. And then they're like. Cut I'm, the window out of their Yeah, size. I might not take that person a week off, even though they could potentially benefit from it. It's like they've only been consistent for three months of their life. And like giving them a week off could be just all it needs to, to send stop them it. At, yeah, to stop it. Yeah, so. for, for me at this point, I just started now doing this kind of stuff. And what I literally do on those weeks is I focus on getting more sleep. I focus on eating even more than I did before. And it's uh, paying me back uh, tremendously as a result. Look, if you love the show, Come get some free stuff. We have free fitness guides at mindpumpfree.com. You can also find us all on Instagram. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm on Instagram at mindpumpdestefano. And Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. 